hundred years ago, the Vikings exploded out of the cold North Sea, like beasts unleashed upon an unsuspecting world. They came from the land of fjords, a land hard to farm and bitter clan rivalries, modern day Scandinavia. They left behind legends of their violence and courage, sagas of exploration and conquest, along with treasures buried in their Scandinavian homelands. In 1880, Norwegian archaeologists made an extraordinary discovery, opening a window to the past and revealing for the first time how the Vikings truly lived and died. They found shards of strange tools, jewels and wood carvings. It was amazing. It, was, it transformed Vikings from a marauding uh, uh, culture of the north with, with supposedly horned helmets and, and uh, swords descending on Europe into a people who had a civilization as complex and as artistic as any in Europe at the time. One object, unearthed at a number of burial sites across Scandinavia, revealed more about the Viking Norse people than any other. A grave ship, buried as a tomb and filled with the goods its owner needed for his voyage to the afterlife. The only way to get from place to place was by boat, and they developed wonderful boats. The, the, when they first started excavating, they didn't believe that they actually sailed in these wonderful ships. They were wonderfully seaworthy, very handleable, and could, of course, they only drew about three inches or something and could go up rivers. One of the wonderful things that the Vikings did oftentimes with their great personages was to bury them in their ships with all the implements because they felt that they were then going death brought a journey. All the implements that one might need for life into eternity was put on the ship and then buried. And so it's all very well preserved. Who were these mysterious barbarians with their elaborate burials? And what drove them to dominate the Dark Ages? Their story began in the late 700s in the uplands of Norway. We do have some indications of what life was like before the Vikings took to the sea and began their raids. They tend to be a sedentary, agriculturally oriented people uh, who were pretty much organized around villages or, or clans of some sort, probably familiarly oriented, although we're not exactly sure about that. Um, but they, they tended to have chiefs who, who ruled these little groups and sometimes had war in between them. But the Viking life was very much one of, of survival. The climate was colder uh, than would have been in the rest of Europe. Uh, the weather could be brutal at times. Uh, it was probably difficult to stay, uh, to stay alive. And that's an important point to make. At the dawn of the Viking Age, the family farm was the basic economic unit of Norse life. As farmers and herdsmen, they planted grains and vegetables during the short growing seasons and relied heavily on livestock. But peace in the Northland was coming to an end. The expanding Viking population needed more fertile farmland and tensions boiled over. Inevitably, violence flared between the Viking clans as the stronger attacked the weaker Raiders fell on farmers with axes, swords, and brutal violence. Land feuds erupted with utter lawlessness. Basically, a king was a man who had a big farm. And he had his bonders, his uh, farmers, and his slaves. And whenever he felt like going and attacking somebody else, he just got all his guys together and went off and attacked them. The Vikings would run into the village, grab everything they could, take off again. It's not terribly sophisticated, but very effective. 
Some Vikings, however, set aside their differences and prepared to seek their fortunes elsewhere. The hands and tools that once shaped the cross beams of barns turned to another task. Along the shores of the northern inlets, boats were built. Boats that changed the lives of these people. Viking longships. These extraordinary vessels, revolutionary in design, took history on a new course and launched an onslaught that dominated Europe and beyond for the next three centuries. In the longship, Vikings drew on generations of boat building techniques and seafaring skills. Uh, there would have been no Vikings without the Viking ship. Uh, and it, it is that evolution of that technology that allowed them to, to make such a mark on history. In time, they learned to make boats that were seaworthy enough to travel the North Atlantic. This was really what gave the Vikings their, their long reach. Uh, you could put one of these boats together in uh, maybe a month or six weeks. Uh, and the design was always exactly the same. And they would make the boat either as broad as they needed for, for calm waters or as deep as they needed it for open oceans. And if they wanted a boat to, to go up the, uh, uh, the rivers of Russia or in, in Europe, a raiding boat that might go into the heart of the continent, uh, they could make the same style, the same construction technique, but just a small version. They were light enough to be carried over portages, they could be dragged up rivers, uh, and they could be sailed. And that was one of the important features because the boats were swift, like lightning, and, and there wasn't anything that could catch them. It's no longer a coastal vessel like many of the Mediterranean ones were. They would make the jump from Norway to Scotland, and from the Faroe Islands to Iceland, and from Iceland to Greenland, over open waters that were far too dangerous for coastal vessels ever to take on. And the Vikings weren't frightened by this, and they had the technology to make it happen. The result was a boat with a low draft and high adaptability, a technological marvel for its day. No single king or central government led these people. Each Norse village acted independently, each declared its own king. The Vikings banded together on this bold mission, leaving women and children behind and taking to the seas. They were after plunder, so they armed themselves accordingly. Among the first victims of their raiding were the monks of Lindisfarne, home to St. Cuthbert's Monastery in June 793. Lindisfarne was one of the holiest places in the British Isles, rich with piety and with more tangible treasures. These monks, are, their bells are ringing, they're going to mass, and up out of the sea come these dragons. And the Vikings came on them just like a storm and cut them down, carried off everything, and um, burned the place. The monks were met by hell. And they described it often as if the devils from hell are being unleashed on them. The Vikings were warriors, there's no doubt, but they lived by intimidation, and, uh, fear, and terrorism. They were raiders. They weren't soldiers. I think they were extremely fierce and extremely greedy uh, and extremely skillful. I mean, we think of these, these people as being barbarians, but in fact, I think the order of battle, the way in which they moved on a target in a very disciplined military way, the Viking warrior was a very simple uh, war machine. It was a, a big, brawny Scandinavian, uh, uh, often dressed in leather uh, hide uh, armor. Each person was equipped with very simple tools, a knife, a sword, and a battle axe. And uh, reportedly, it was the battle axe that was the fiercest of these weapons because the Vikings had tremendous skill in throwing these axes to, uh, uh, you know, lop off people's heads or incapacitate them. The monasteries along the coast particularly appealed to the Vikings. <laughs> 
because of their great accumulation of wealth and the passivity of the monks. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, begun in the late 800s, is the primary source of English history from the 5th to the 11th century. It records the terror wrought by the Viking invaders. The ravages of heathen men miserably destroyed God's church on Lindisfarne with plunder and slaughter. This attack on these monks and their treasures in 793 AD was an historical milestone, the first major Viking sea raid. But Lindisfarne and the other vulnerable monasteries along the coast of the British Isles were only the beginning. As the 8th century drew to a close, the Viking raiders set their sights on larger prizes. The major cities of Europe were about to feel the power and the fury of these Norsemen and the bite of their steel. The Vikings left Scandinavia to plunder. The 793 AD attack on Lindisfarne sparked an inferno of Viking barbarism that threatened to consume all of Europe. By the middle of the 9th century, only 50 years or so after Lindisfarne, word of Europe's removable wealth had spread. Norse families, villages and whole communities banded together to build longships. They planned to improve their situation at the expense of those across the sea. All the Spaniards later when they came to America, they were looking for gold, but the Vikings were looking for silver. And silver was the great thing to, uh, to them. And a lot of the religious implements, crosses, and the various uh, things that one finds in a, in a monastery were made out of silver. The Viking factions headed out across the sea with no single ruler to unite them. Even when their fleets swelled to scores of ships, each still acted independently, making the onslaught all the more difficult to stop. As the reputations of individual Viking leaders began to grow, so too did their ambitions. Europe was theirs for the taking. Europe is, a, is an odd continent in that it is crisscrossed by rivers that are all navigable. Unlike North America or Africa or some of the others, which only have a, a few very large rivers, uh, Europe has many. So almost any large body of water that the Vikings could take their vessels down, remember they're, they're narrow and they're long and they don't take a lot of water. One of the first major river attacks came in 845 AD at the hands of a notorious Viking leader, Ragnar, a Dane. With a fleet of 120 ships, he seized upon the legacy of Lindisfarne with a vengeance, using the Seine to attack Paris. Before they got to the city, Ragnar's Vikings decimated the French advance force on the banks of the Seine, marching their French captives to a hideous end. They were basically terrorists, and they relied on the terror to ease the way uh, quite a lot. They, they, you know, they, weren't, they didn't want to do any more work than they had to, so it'd be as awful as possible. There was a, a famous Viking um, who was known as the child lover because he would not throw babies into the air and spit them on his sword as they came down. I mean, th these were not nice guys. A local monk, Ermentarius, described the Viking onslaught and devastation that continued for decades along the Seine and Loire rivers. The number of ships grows. The endless stream of Vikings never ceases to increase. Everywhere, the Christians are the victims of massacres, burnings, plunderings. The Vikings conquer all in their path, and nothing resists them. When the large Viking fleet sails down the Seine River and proceeds on Paris. This huge town that is well defended, the king, the king of France, who is residing in Paris, chooses instead of facing them, and the possible destruction that could come from facing the Vikings, actually decides to buy them off. The king of France, Charles the Bald, paid Ragnar nearly six tons of silver and gold bullion to get the raiders to leave and never come back. <laughs> 
it had the opposite effect. As word spread that such loot could be had, that land and goods were everywhere, the pillage of northern Europe continued with a fervor. Between 790 and 1100 AD, Vikings followed every major river and water route into the heart of the continent. But for the Vikings, a new world awaited. Norwegians wrote perhaps the most colorful chapter in Viking history. As fearless explorers, they colonized Iceland and Greenland as they pushed further west. With this colonization came the story of two legendary Norwegian Vikings, Eric the Red and his son Leif Eriksson. In the late 900s, Eric became the first to settle this unforgiving land. A fiery character, Eric was soon banished for three years from Iceland as well. He sailed west and settled on the east coast of Greenland. And so he begins to advertise this land, and he can't very well say, by the way, we only have a little bit of coastline that is at all habitable. So he goes over and says, we've got Greenland. It's covered in green. Some of them undoubtedly come, see what it is, is really like, and go home. But a lot of very strong and stalwart and hardy Vikings stay, and they have a life that is very harsh. The ground wasn't very tillable, but fishing was available, and other uh, meat was available. But it was a harsh land. During Eric the Red's leadership, a Norse agrarian society scratched a living in this distant land. For government, the villages convened at Althing, a kind of public assembly or court of law transplanted from their homelands. Here, free men had the right to speak in their defense and on issues of community concern. From this community of free men came Eric the Red's son, Leif Eriksson. Like his father, he yearned to explore. In the year 1000, he set sail. Leif Erikson follows a rumor. Another Viking before him has left an account that he was traveling to the west by to go to the other colony in, in Greenland and gets blown off course. And by the time he is found his direction, he's off the coast of a very green and luscious land. Well, Greenland was not green, nor was it luscious. This is a fascinating thing and still very, uh, very controversial in a way. Uh, I personally believe that uh, America was, was discovered by, um, by the Vikings uh, in, in or about the year 1000. Leif Erikson's uh, village in, uh, in Newfoundland has been carbon dated, for example, precisely to the year 1000 AD. So we know that, that Vikings were at least in Newfoundland and probably uh, farther to the, to the south than that. The Greenlanders' attempt to settle here failed. The Newfoundland colony lasted only a decade. But 500 years before Columbus made his epic journey, Vikings had linked the eastern and western hemispheres. After wintering in Newfoundland, Leif Erikson returned to Greenland and introduced something new to the island settlers. With the same tools that built the longships, they built the rugged crosses of a new religion. They decided that they would convert. Leif Erikson went to Norway where the king asked him specifically to take Christianity to Greenland and to Christianize Greenland uh, colonies, which he dutifully did. As Viking influence spread, the wider world in turn shaped Viking culture. Their leaders saw Christianity as a means to unite the clans and ultimately to wield more control over them. <laughs> 
At the dawn of the 11th century, 200 years after the attack at Lindisfarne, the Norse people still had no single king and little sense of solidarity. It was Christianity that presented a reason to unite. But the Christian Vikings experienced resistance from their pagan tribesmen to give up their ancient gods. The kings began to go for Christianity because it helped them. It helped them consolidate power. And they began to impose it on these people. And there was a lot of struggle. The, the people didn't like it. They didn't want to give up their old ways. They were afraid of giving up their old ways. There were some Christian missionaries that came on uh, the island and went around and converted a few. But there were a lot of skeptics. And at one certain occasion, they decided that they were going to go into a test against the pagan deities and the representative of pagan deities, which was known as a berserker, a man who was a little crazy, to put it nicely. And so these Christian missionaries challenge him. So we'll build a fire and you pagans build a fire. If the berserker passes through your fire but can't pass through ours, then we know Christianity is one. If he can't pass through yours, then we know paganism is one. It's almost like an Old Testament duel. Well, the story says that the Viking berserker came in, passed easily over the fire that was made by the pagans, but could not penetrate the fire that was made by Christians. And thus everyone around saw that Christianity was the right religion and thus joined. Back in Norway, the great catalyst for Viking unity emerged in the destiny of one young boy. Harald Hardrada was the half-brother of Norway's King Olaf and his heir apparent. He was just 15 years old, fighting on the losing side of a Viking civil war. But Harald returned to extract his revenge and wrote his own history in the blood of his enemies. The Vikings spread like a murderous plague across Europe. The first to fall were unarmed monasteries, but soon the invaders took terror deeper into the continent. Eventually, the Vikings turned upon themselves. Norway was locked in civil war. In 1030, the Battle of Stiklestad pitted forces loyal to current Danish ruler Knut the Great against Norwegian King Olaf. From the ashes of the infighting, a young warrior had risen, Harald Hodrada, King Olaf's half-brother and heir. In the middle of the 11th century, as Harald grew to manhood, he developed the ambition to lead and unite Norway. But first, he had to win the power to do so. Harold was an interesting character. He begins his Viking regime, if you will, when he's a young man. At 16, he's wounded in a battle that will eventually take his royal brother's life, and he is a flea. Harold Hardrada faced exile in the faraway northern lands. He headed to Sweden, and then eventually to Kiev, a thriving trading city in what is now the Ukraine. In 1031, he followed the route of the Swedish Vikings, who had established trading centers during the previous two centuries to access exotic Eastern goods. The Swedes came as violent raiders, but stayed to become traders. Through trade, Kiev connected the Norse world with the wider world of the East. Uh, when they find coin hoards of this period, the coins are from all over the world. And they, f they found like little statues of Buddha in the ruins of Hedeby. And it's, uh, these were the, the connections of these people. They were, they're far more important because of this than because of the Basham Smasham stuff. Harold realized that without a market for his plunder, his power was limited. 
Vikings had lived on trade for hundreds of years. When you go out there and you trash a monastery and you grab a bunch of cups and some manuscripts, you're not going to take them home. You know, what, what use are they to you? You have to go someplace and swap them for what you really want. But material goods made up only part of the trading. The Vikings also dealt in men. As slave masters, they traded the men and women captured in their raiding parties. Women died in those days at an appalling rate in childbirth, so you had a constant resupply with women, and they would seize the girls and carry them off and undoubtedly rape them, and then take them to slave pens and sell them off. But despite Kiev's economic lessons, Harold had not come this far to seek his fortune in the marketplace. He must also assume the mantle of a warrior and learn the skills that would make him a king. By the year 1038, Harold had grown confident and hungry for plunder, leading an elite force of Viking mercenaries. He fought on behalf of foreign rulers across the east, winning wealth and power as he prepared to return to Norway and seize the crown. In Sicily, Harold demonstrated his legendary resourcefulness. Harold's a generalship is characterized not necessarily by great courage, but by great slyness. And this is a major Viking uh, virtue, is rather than go and just bash people over the head, if you can be sneaky, you know, they prefer that. Uh, one of his tactics was at, they, they came to a city and they besieged the city and, and he had his men capture the little birds that were flying in and out of the city. And with pitch and string, they attached little burning twigs to the backs of the birds and let them go. The birds flew back into the city to their nests in the thatch and immediately started the city on fire, so they took the city. In King Harald's saga, 13th century Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson told of the plan's effectiveness in conquering Sicily. At that, all the people came out of the town begging for mercy, he writes. The very same people who had been shouting defiant insults at the army and its leader for days on end. Harald spared the lives of all those who begged for quarter and took control of the town. After nearly 15 years, the cunning Harold had amassed the reputation and wealth he needed to at last lay rightful claim to his fractured native lands. In 1046, he headed back to Scandinavia. A famous mercenary with the riches and ambition of a king, but without a title. As next in the line for the throne of Norway, he was ready to stake his claim. Problem is, is his nephew's on the throne now. And so in order to reclaim it, he has to do a little dealing. All right, what do we do? He's a pretty politically astute individual. And so, of course, he makes a deal with his nephew that they can co-rule the throne. That works. Nephew dies in a year. We don't have anything to suggest that Harold puts him to death, although there are certainly accusations that are thrown in this direction. Harold doesn't deny them. And ultimately, Harold is now back in charge of Norway. With Harold's claim to the throne completed, he moved to assure his power remained unchallenged. In 1047, he set out to obliterate his adversaries. In a brutal mixture of tactics and vengeance, Harold unleashed an unholy fury against all who opposed him. In 1047 AD, after years of gaining power, Harald Hadrada became king of Norway. He ruled the Vikings through sheer force. Harald's men were merciless as they lay waste to the farms and villages of those who opposed him. Their message was simple, submit or die. Across the country, 
Harold's enemies paid the ultimate price for their disloyalty. In King Harold's saga, the king celebrated his insatiable cruelty in his own words. I kill without compunction and remember all my killings. Treason must be scotched by fair means or foul before it overwhelms me. The oak trees of insurrection grow from the acorns of treachery. With the insurrection crushed, a celebration was in order. King Harold's faithful supporters filled his longhouse for a lavish celebration. If you had a lot of money, if you had lots of gold, you were a very big he in the Vikings because you gave it away to people. This was how they accumulated their armies. Well, you've got to feed these guys, and also you've got to be able to lay gold on them because that's what they want. You have to be able to hand them a gold ring when they do something wonderful or give a skull a gold cup or something. So you have to have a huge amount of treasure, and if you have a huge amount of treasure, then you become an important guy, and which is the whole point of, of Harold in um, going through these palace plunders, which was where you accumulated a lot of gold. The Viking lord was a man who attracted men to him by power of personality and uh, he had to uh, have a, a reputation for, um, for for victory for getting out there taking you someplace getting you a big victory and not getting you killed so uh, men accumulated at these halls and they would have huge feasts and everybody got lots of gold and everybody drank lots of mead and then um, every once in a while they'd all get together and and take their swords and go off and kill somebody. But for the most part, it was this great Viking hall thing that was kind of the center of, of uh, Viking life. In the Great Hall, Viking political deals were made, allegiances forged, and power wielded. It was a very fluid system that allowed Vikings to take advantage of, uh, you know, whatever the situation was and to move and, and uh, reformulate. And it could flip over in an instant if a, uh, a leader fell or was killed in battle or humiliated or something happened and somebody else would rise up immediately, often from a totally different direction. With Kiev as his model, King Harold set out to create a major trading center at a strategic seaside town where goods from all over the world would be available. The town was Oslo destined to be one of the region's great ports. King Harold knew it was trade that would unite the Viking people and bring them the wealth and stability they desired. The markets of Oslo brimmed with goods from Viking farms, wheat and vegetables, furs and fabrics. Viking longboats brought back goods from all over the known world, spices, gold, textiles, precious stones and slaves. Pottery and glass from Germany were traded, silver jewelry from France, and coins from the faraway Arab lands. The Viking people became shrewd merchants as Oslo grew and prospered. The ordinary life of this trading community was revealed in the goods interred with them. Gold, engraved weapons, jewelry, the ordinary wooden goods of the Vikings themselves. But the development of a major trade center only whet Harold's appetite for greater riches and control. Harold decides a bigger target is in order, and that target is England. And he gets on a boat, a number of boats, of course. He's joined by the rebellious brother of the King of England, and off uh, Harold Arthrothy goes. As he looked toward England in the future, Harold surely imagined his own empire stretching as far as his longboats could take him. The one-time refugee had gained astonishing power and political clout among his belligerent people. He had already conquered the toughest of his own Viking enemies. His actions were met with little resistance. England and all its wealth seemed within easy reach of his iron grasp. But awaiting Harold and his men was a tough and disciplined army 
and a struggle greater than any he had faced. In late September 1066 AD, a rider bore dark, urgent news for the city of York. The Viking king, Harald Hadrada, was approaching. The English knew well his reputation for brutality. Only swift action and great courage could stop him. Harold began his conquest on the coast. And after winning a quick succession of violent conflicts, his victory looked all but assured. York seemed prepared to surrender. Harold and a contingent of his troops headed for Stamford Bridge, some seven miles from the city. He'd expected York's leaders to pay homage and to present hostages as tribute. In fact, Harold was so convinced that the north of England was already his, he had less than the full complement of his men with him. And they left behind their armor. But the English were not so casual. Their king, Harold Godwinson, marched his soldiers in double time through the forest to cut off the Viking army. The swordsmen wore chain mail and the archers were well armed. When the English army shows up, at least the sagas tell us, they're completely surprised as they see the armor shining in the sun of the midday, coming closer and closer to them. They don't know who it is. But as it gets closer and closer, they recognize who it is. According to King Harold's saga to the Vikings, it looked like a sheet of ice when the weapons glistened. A fateful decision took Harold. Rather than retreat and wait for the rest of his troops to arrive from the ships, he wanted to fight. At one point, the English pulled back. Harold sensed victory, and his forces broke formation. There's a story. One warrior stood on the bridge and held off all the English. These were tiny, tiny armies, but that's not unheard of in the Middle Ages, where battles with large numbers of armies are not that common. According to King Harold's saga, Harold rallied his men with these words. Carry your head always high in battle, where swords seek to shatter the skulls of doomed warriors. The guy on the bridge held them off. But then once he was jabbed, they were able to cut to Harold. With the bridge open, the English soldiers poured down on the lightly armored Viking forces, cutting through them like a scythe. The battle was savage. The Viking used all their skill and courage, but one after another, the Vikings fell, their blood soaking into the English soil in an appalling slaughter. The Viking sagas recount the struggle. The fight sharp leader's heart wavered not. The strong king showed all the greatest courage in the thunder of the fight. His bloody sword wounded the enemy to death. In the midst of the battle, an arrow, well aimed or guided by fate, lodged in the throat of Harald Hadrada. Harald's reinforcements arrive late in the day, too late. Outnumbered and outmaneuvered, the Vikings faced an almost total rout. By nightfall, the Viking defeat was absolute. Harold Hardrada arrived in England in September 1066 with thousands of soldiers and the grandest ambition, but found only ruin and death. Harold Hardrada had 270 ships to bring over his army from Norway and only 30 returned. In the decades following, the Vikings continued their sporadic attacks, but none reached as far or came so close to empire as Harald at his last stand. In a matter of weeks, a new era of European history took hold. <laughs> 
By the time of Harold's death in 1066, Viking influence had spread deep roots throughout world culture, trade, and history, and sowed the seeds of Viking downfall, assimilation, their absorption into the lands they colonized, and the spreading, unifying force of Christianity brought about their end as much as any single defeat in battle. Essentially, Europe's history changes. Russia is now Russia, land of the Vikings. The Rus were Vikings. Normandy is now land of the Normans. The Normans were Vikings. Uh, ultimately, the Normans would conquer England. And so their legacy is extensive in the history of Europe. As warriors, as settlers, as explorers and traders, Vikings were agents of an extraordinary social and political change, spurring global economic growth and the fortification of Europe, along with the development of national identities, advances in shipbuilding and navigation. Their brutal raids gave Vikings an enduring reputation as barbarians, but in their quest for opportunity, for riches and control, the Vikings didn't destroy Western civilization. They enriched it. <laughs> 